All right. So let's uh, renormalize this operator and see how the classic result for the renormalization group evolution of the PDF comes, out, comes about. And again, the way that you should think about this is you have an operator, and you should just renormalize it. And it should, you shouldn't have to, once you've got the effective theory, you shouldn't have to think too deeply about what you're doing. You should just be able to follow your nose and do the renormalization. You may have to be careful because these operators are kind of complicated. They have this dependence on this, these Ws that you have to be careful about. But uh, really, it's just follow your nose. Compute the one-loop gra graphs. When you, if you look up sort of how Peskin would do one renormalization, there'd be an infinite number of operators. You'd have to derive a renormalization group result for all of them. Here, we only have one operator, and we're just going to renormalize it. Our operator is non-local in the sense that it depends on these omegas, and that's what's encoding this infinite number of operators that, that Peskin has. Okay, so solving, if you'd like, for f from the formula that we had before, I can do that by integrating over the w minus that just sets the delta that sets these guys to be equal, and then if I so I can think of it as that there's one free momentum c, and that free momentum c is one of these labels, which is this guy here. So c is w over. Pn minus, and this is the, the proton, which is carrying some momentum Pn minus. Okay, this is the proton state, which carries momentum Pn minus, and there's one delta function. I could put it either place, but I only need one because the other one's kind of trivial. So the first thing you can think about it doing here is looking at mass dimensions. And I'd already told you that this guy was dimensionless, but let's check that that's true. So mass dimension. So relativistically normalized states have mass dimension minus 1. Quark fields that don't have a delta function have mass dimensions 3 halves. The delta function here has, gives a minus 1. And then they're minus 1, so you get 0. 3 halves plus 3 halves minus 3 ones is 0. So that means this f is really a dimensionless function, and that's why it makes sense that we defined it to depend on this dimensionless ratio. You can also look at the lambda dimension. And here's how that works. That's also 0. So the only thing that's, so we already had a uh, power counting for our chi fields. Remember, the C field inside the chi field scale like 1. So this is just coming about because this guy's a water lambda. The delta function just involved large momentum, so it has no power counting. And the only thing that's non-trivial is that the states have power counting minus 1. So here's how we can derive that. So if you think about relativistically normalized states, what you're doing is you're defining sort of the inverse of this d3p over e, which you can write actually, which is more convenient for power counting, in terms of things that are that are, we can power count more simply. So this is an exact relation for a non-shell particle between p minuses and, and pz. And so then I can write, because of that, the standard relativistic normalization formula for a state with two different momenta as kind of the inverse. 
be this. So the usual formula would have 2e two, two e and then a delta 3, right? Because it's the inverse of this. But I can write it also this way. This guy is lambda 0. This guy is lambda minus 2. Therefore, each of these guys must be lambda minus 1. That's where the minus 1 came from. All right. So we want to renormalize that thing, that matrix element. And what loops can do is that they can change omega. So you might, or, or C, they're equivalent. And so the way that you should think of that is in the following sense. And it's actually something you're familiar with, although you're familiar with it for discrete quantum numbers. And here, in some sense, we have a continuous one. So you have some function, fq, that depends on some variable c. And it can mix under the renormalization group with an operator at a different value of c. So you can really think of the fact that loops can change this omega as just a mixing. You're used to mixing for discrete quantum numbers. You write down all the operators that have the same quantum numbers, and they can mix under renormalization. Here, there's kind of a, an additional thing that the, the object can depend on, which is the C parameter. And in general, when you do the renormalization, that can change too. Because the operators are, or matrix elements here are labeled by the C, in general, there's no reason that it should stay the same under the loop corrections. And, it was really a special case that we dealt with last time that it did, where that did happen, but in general it doesn't. OK. So this is actually what we expect to happen in general, unless we can argue that it doesn't happen. Because you should think of each value of C as giving a different operator different matrix element. So I could write formulas here just for the operator. It's actually the operator that gets renormalized, not the matrix element. So every, I'm going to keep writing Fs just to avoid too much notation. But we could always actually replace the Fs by just uh, the operator. And we could do everything in terms of actually just the W instead of the C variable. But I'll just keep using F. So. What does this mean in terms of the operator is the following. We can think of if we have some bare operator, and we want to split that into a piece that has divergences and a piece that is just the finite pieces, the general formula for doing that involves an integral. So this guy here. So there's also these indices i and j, and that's the, that's the flavor, if you like, or quarks and gluons. So i is quark or gluon. And in general, you can also have a mixing in the quark and gluon operators. We started with these two different operators, and they can mix under renormalization as well. So. So there's two operators in the effective theory, same order in lambda, and they can mix when you do the renormalization. And I'll draw a diagram in a minute. So this thing here is mu independent. This thing here in MS bar has all the 1 over epsilon uvs. And it also depends on alpha of mu. And it depends on these c and c prime. And this guy here is uv finite. So this guy here is really the thing that's the low energy matrix element. But remember what low energy meant here. Low energy was physics at lambda QCD, physics of the initial state proton. So there are actually, in this guy, there are IR divergences. This is just some matrix element in the effective theory. And in general, it could be IR divergent if you calculate it. And this guy actually is. And it really encodes. That's not going to bother us at all, because this is really some universal thing that encodes lambda QCD effects. And that's what parton distribution functions are. And from the point of view of what we're doing, it doesn't really matter that it has this extra IR divergence, although we will have to regulate diagrams in order to separate UV and IR divergences because of that 
really, in terms of the renormalization, what we're after is getting the UV divergences. OK, so the usual kind of formula that you'd have, where you just write O is Z times O, is slightly more complicated here. There's this extra integral. And now, remember how you derive a renormalization group equation. What you do is you say mu d by mu of this guy is 0. And so if I take mu d by d mu, on the right-hand side, I get mu d by d mu of z and mu d by d mu of f. And I can rearrange that in the usual way, except for keeping track of these integrals, is as follows. So I imagine that there's a z and a z inverse. And, in, and the relation between z and z inverse is as follows. Uh, let's call this double prime. It's, a, it's matrix multiplication except in the function space, right? So this is like a delta function. So if, if you'd like, you can just think that there's more indices. We have, in some sense, what we have in terms of the quark and gluon operators mixing is a matrix equation, right? This is a vector. This is a matrix. This is a vector for the indices i and j. And you can think of this integral here as just another you know, it really looks the way I've drawn it, right? Like this is contracted with that, and this is <laughs> summing over the indices, and it really that, that's what it is. So it's really this idea that it's just mixing of quantum numbers is kind of a good way of thinking about things. And when you think about formulas, you know, you're just summing over the, the, these indices, and the chronic of delta becomes a regular delta. So in that sense, it's not that hard to do, to do this. And so, we get an almost dimension equation. Which again has that kind of form of with an integral for the renormalized guy. And it has mixing in this gamma ij. If we go through the steps and use this formula, it looks like this. So I'm kind of skipping steps, but I hope that you, get, you can kind of picture where this result will come from. And it's actually not. It's pretty easy to go from that line with this formula to this line. This is one line. I just split it into two things and defined this quantity, gamma ij, which is the anomalous dimension. So this mu in the QCD language is the factorization scale? Yeah. That's right. OK. So at one loop, things are simpler, because at one loop, this thing, we can just replace it by delta i i prime, chronic of delta at one loop, uh, because at one loop, we just need the order alpha piece from this guy. And then we can set the tree level for that guy. So at one loop, which is all we're going to do, we get the simpler formula. OK, so that's our setup. And now we want to calculate this one one almost dimension by calculating the 1 over epsilon alpha s term in the zij. Before I do that, is there any questions? All right, so tree level. So think about there being an external P for whatever state I'm considering. And then the operator is labeled by W. And so we're summing over spin. I've kind of somehow, sometimes I've dropped that. I said it last time. And so we get some spinners, and we get a delta function. 
So what the delta function in the operator is, is it's delta function of w minus this label momentum p bar. And in something like this, where it's completely trivial and there's just one state, we just get the momentum of that state, which is p. This sum over spin here is a p minus. And so the result is a delta function of 1 minus omega over p minus for this tree level matrix element. One loop. Now we have to think about how we're going to regulate the IR. And I'll do it with an off shellness. So I'll introduce a non zero P plus, and that will be enough to regulate IR di divergences. And we're really after the UV ones, so we just want to separate these guys out. So there's some different diagrams. We insert our operator and we just attach gluons. So one thing we can do is just string a gluon across, kind of like a standard vertex renormalization diagram. So there's some loop momenta. Let me label it on the quark line. And then the gluon here, which is a clinear gluon, has momentum p minus l. And it's forward, so this kind of set up. There's some numerator to deal with, and I'm not going to go through that, but it simplifies to something kind of simple. After some Dirac algebra, it simplifies down just to an L perp squared. For this diagram, there's two L squared propagators, and there's one L minus P squared propagator. And then there's a delta function from the insertion of the operator. But now the delta function doesn't involve the external momentum as it did there. It involves the loop momentum. And that's what I've been, that was kind of the whole point of this example. So we have a delta function of L minus minus W. And then there's some dim reg factors, which we can be careful about if we want. So in MS bar, we'd have some factor like that. So this is some loop integral that we just have to do. And, can do it with kind of standard techniques. So in my notes, I wrote it in terms of as a function of epsilon. And then epsilon is just regulating the ultraviolet, and we expand in epsilon. So let me just write down the result after expanding. And A here has the infrared regulator, P plus, P minus. And it also has a Z and a 1 minus Z, which you can group all together. And Z is just this ratio that thing is dependent on at tree level, omega over P minus. Now, when I'm doing this calculation, this is a small P, not a big P, because I'm using quark states, OK? Not a proton state. So really, I should, if I wanted to think about this as an f, I should say it's an f for the quark state. But I think that you can remember that. Um, but the re renormalization of the operator doesn't depend on the state, remember? We always take the simplest states possible when we're doing the renormalization or doing matching. And so we can, we're free to use quark states. And that's what we're doing. OK. That's one diagram. Now there's another diagram. I should be B. For some reason, in my notes, I call it 1, which doesn't make any sense. And we can contract the gluon with the Wilson line. So there's, there's that graph, and there's a symmetric friend. And each of these actually has two contractions, because there was two Wilson lines 
the way we wrote our operators. So our operators we wrote is like this. And you can think, so let's just think of a contraction with the quark. You can think that there's a contraction like that, and there's a contraction like that of a gluon. OK, I'm contracting gluons with quarks. But really what I mean is I'm contracting to the Lagrangian right? that this quark is evolving under. So hopefully that's clear. <laughs> All right, so there's two different ways in which w when I work out the Feynman rule for this thing where I, where I attach the gluon, you can either get the gluon from here or the gluon from there. That's all I'm saying. But these actually have different in physical interpretations. Because this delta function here, if you think about what it's doing, it's really, in the original diagram, it's like the cut. So in the original diagrams that we were drawing, we would cut them because we take the imaginary part. And this delta function is in the middle. We have a kind of a parton on this side and a squared parton on that side. This delta function is the cut. So this contraction here is actually corresponds to a virtual graph. And this guy here corresponds to real emission because you're doing a contraction across the cut. Right? So one of these guys would be a graph like this, and the other one would be a graph like that. I could label them 1 and 2, 1, 2. But we'll just keep them and treat them all together. These two graphs give an overall factor of 2. So that's simple. There's some spinner stuff. Just even simpler in this case. So I write it out. There's some stuff from the Wilson line. And then there's two propagators. Let me not write all the i0s. And then there's two diff different delta functions. So either we have the real graph where the loop is inside, where the w is inside, or we have the virtual graph where the w, where the, sorry. Either we have the real graph where the loop goes around the, w, the delta function, or we have the virtual graph where this guy is overall on that thing. So in the overall one, it's just a p minus minus w like it was at tree level. And in the real emission, it's an l minus minus w. And one's a w, one's a w dagger, so there's a relative sign. So the sign is just easy to understand. It's w versus w dagger, which has a relative sign. OK, so if we just followed our nose with what the Feynman rule for these, this thing is, that's what we would get. And this is, again, some loop integral that we can do. One way of writing the results as follows. And there's one thing we have to be careful about here. Which is why I'm writing this all out. So there's actually a cancellation between the virtual and the real diagrams of an infrared divergence. And I want to be careful about that. this guy out in epsilon dimensions, fully without expanding first. OK, so there's a, this is the real contribution, and this is the virtual. So in order to, to sort of deal with this, we have to make use of something that's called a distribution identity. If you know what the result is for the anomalous dimension, you'll be aware of the fact that it involves something called a plus function. The splitting functions for a parton distribution involve something called a plus function.
So the way that we can deal with that is as follows. The way we can deal with the fact that actually the result is going to be a distribution, we have to be careful. Because you see, z goes to 1 is being regulated by epsilon. And so if we integrate over z, for example, it's epsilon that's going to allow us to integrate all the way to 1. And we'd like to encode that in some way where we can expand in epsilon, because that's what we need to do in order to extract the anomalous dimension. And this formula is what allows us to do that. So I'll tell you how to derive it after I tell you what the L is. So ln of anything is defined to be a plus function with a log to that power. And the plus function is defined so that if you integrate from 0 to 1, you get 0. And if you integrate with a test function, which is the more general result that you need to define it, so you can define it by this result with a test function. And it just gives you the normal function, but the test function with the subtraction that makes the test function more convergent so that you can integrate at through 0. OK, so that's the definition of the plus function. You can also define it with a limit. This will be sufficient. OK, so this, these things are like delta functions. The way that you would derive this formula is you would say, well, if z is away from 1, then I can expand, because then there's no problem. And if z is away from 1, it turns out that this plus function is just the regular function. It's only that at 1 that something special is happening. And so the standard expansion is what you'd get if you took z away from 1. And to see what's happening at z equals 1, you just integrate both sides from 0 to 1. And that's how you can derive the coefficient of the delta function. All right. So if I plug this formula in here for this thing, then I actually get another 1 over epsilon in this guy. There's a gamma of epsilon out front, and that guy's good. This is our uv divergence. This is our 1 over epsilon uv. But there's also a gamma of minus epsilon here, which is an ir divergence. So even though I tried to regulate all the ir by off-shellness, it didn't quite work, and there was one that was regulated by dim rag. And that one actually cancels between these two pieces. Once I use this, this identity and, and take into account that that's an IR divergence. So there's a 1 over epsilon IR times a 1 over epsilon UV. And that cancels between the real and virtual graphs. So this is like a standard 1 over epsilon ir canceling between real and virtual graphs. And since it's only the 1 over epsilon uv that we're interested in, we are really only worry about that part of it canceling. There's a piece, actually, that, anyway. There's the, and then the 1 over epsilon that's left is the, r, is the guy that we're after. in order to get the anomalous dimension. All right, so let me not. So in my notes, I write one more line where I expand this guy out. And I think just because of time, I'm going to skip that. And I'll just write the final result. When we do the final result, we also have to include wave function renormalization. So you can think of this graph as. wave function normalization term. And it just involves the delta function again, like the tree level graph. So something like that. So in general, if I wanted to do this calculation at one loop, there's one more type of diagram I should consider. Okay, And that's a, a graph where I could have mixing. 
These guys should be dashed since we're in the effective theory. So how does the mixing graph work? Well, there's a graph where I have external gluons, but I still am normalizing the same operator. Okay, I've still asserted the quark operator here, but now we have antiquarks in this theory. We can draw a triangle like that. And this graph here would give a mixing that involves, that would give a mixing term in the anomalous dimension where you're mixing gluons and quarks. So this mixes what we sort of called O glue. Let me just say this. But it mixes O glue with O quark, and we could compute this graph too. But I'm going to neglect it just for simplicity. I just won't write it down. One way of doing that rigorously would be to consider operators where the flavors of these guys are different. Okay, that's what would happen, for example, if you were having a W exchange or something. So you could look at non flavor diagonal operators with it like a U quark and a D quark, and then you would not have this mixing with O glue. It's only if the flavors of the quarks are the same that you can write down this diagram. But just think about it as I'm not just. I'm focusing on the quark piece, and in general, there's also a gluon piece. So we have all our one-loop graphs. We know how to expand them in epsilon. And so we just proceed, expand them in epsilon, and add them up. So you could think that what we've derived by doing that is a distribution for a quark inside a quark. So here I'm being, this is the state. And this is what type of operator. And it's a function of some c. And if I go up to one loop, And the tree level was just a delta function of that fraction z. And then at one loop, we had all these other terms. So if I collect all the pieces, I had some delta functions. The graph with the Wilson lines actually gives me one of these L0 functions. And then the graph, so there's wave function normalization plus some other terms that involve delta function. And then there's some other pieces. And then this is all times 1 over epsilon. And then there's other pieces. But if we're interested in ultraviolet renormalization, we only care about the 1 over epsilon. And all of those terms. can be written in a kind of more compact form, which is the more standard form for the anomalous dimension. You can actually group them all together into a plus function, a single plus function, like this. So just in terms of distributions, this distribution is equal to the sum of these pieces. You can see as z goes to 1 that there would be a 2 here and a 2 here, and this would be a 1 over 1 minus z. And that's as z goes to 1 here, that would be 1, and this would be a 1 over 1 minus z. So see some pieces of it matching up. And basically, the way that you would derive this is you'd write 1 plus z squared is a plus b 1 minus z plus c 1 minus z squared. You'd work out what a, b, and c are. Relating two polynomials. And then this guy here, the 1 minus z in the numerator cancels the one in the denominator, and it's not a plus function anymore, it's just a number. And that's how we would connect the two formulas. All right, so we were after determining the z. The z has to cancel this 1 over epsilon. So let's go back to our formula. 
which connected those is this. Our general formula was that the bear guy could be written in terms of split into UV and UV pieces and finite pieces in the following ways is with this integral. Now, this looks like it could be an arbitrary function of C and C prime, but our result here is only a function of Z, which is actually a ratio. And that's actually something that we can argue in general, that this thing here is, not a, is actually only a function of one variable, not two. So that follows from two different things. It follows from RPI3 invariance. So remember that RPI3 invariance said that you should have the same number of n's and n bars. And remember, OK, so that's one thing that you have to use. That tells you that you need to get ratios. Well, the c's are already ratios. So you might say, well, that should be fine. The, the c's are, are already ratios between proton moment, uh, between the momentum in the operator and the momentum in the state, the minus momentum of the operator over the mo minus momentum of the state. Right? And this is a minus momentum. That's a minus momentum. So the Cs are RPI3 invariant. So that doesn't seem like it would imply this. But there's one other thing you know, and that is that it can't depend on the state momentum. I could have taken a proton. I could have taken a quark. And the result for the renormalization shouldn't depend on what state I'm taking. And this combination, where I have dc prime over c prime with the c over c prime, the p minuses cancel out. Okay, so if I were to do the thing with the whole thing with a proton state rather than a quark state then I should still get the same omnomalous dimension. And in order for that to be true, uh, it has to depend on the ratio. And that ratio is then just a ratio of kind of the, the operator, the bare operator and the renormalized operator. It's like saying if you had O of omega bare is a convolution of Z with an omega over omega prime or something. So mega prime renormalized. Okay, and it's only if I've done it in operator level and not even written states, then then it would really just be RPI three invariance. Okay, because I wrote it in terms of states, there was this other momentum available, but I'm, that's not allowed. I'm not allowed to have that be really have be playing a part of this, the discussion. Okay. So. Given that formula, then I can expand to one loop. So this guy I think of as having a tree-level result. This guy is some matrix element that has a tree-level and one loop result as well. So if they're both tree-level, I get delta 1 minus z. And then in some kind of obvious notation, up to one loop order, I can write it out formally like that. And then I know what these tree level things are. This guy's a delta function, and this guy's also a delta function. So I can just do the integral. And it really is pretty simple. All the 1 over epsilon terms are just the z. And what's left would be associated to this guy in perturbation theory. But if we want to do the renormalization, we just need the z. Don't worry about that. OK, so we read off from over here what z is, because z is just this. About there.
So z, okay, that z is just this thing. So when I put the tree level piece together with the one loop piece, then this thing is just z. And then I compute the anomalous dimension by taking mu d by d mu of it. And that hits the alpha. So that kills the epsilon. It gives me a factor of 2 and a minus sign. But the anomalous dimension, gamma qq. So there was a 1 over c prime. And then it was minus mu d by d mu. If I plug in the formula that we have, zqq of c over c prime. So there's a minus here, there's a minus there. And the 2 epsilon cancels this 2 and that epsilon. And this 1 over c prime is the thing we needed to make the measure, RPI invariant. So in this notation, where we, our original t notation, putting all the pieces together, and being careful about theta functions, which I was mostly suppressing. That's the result. OK, so this is the function of c over c prime, which I've just written as z. And then there's some theta functions that are setting the boundaries for the integral. And that comes also out of the calculation. And that's the quark one loop splitting function. So if we'd done the gluon from that other diagram, we would have got the mixing term. OK, so this is the one loop anomalous dimension for the PDF. And it's really just doing operator renormalization, calculating one loop diagrams in the effective theory. Questions? Okay.